this episode of Voice of the Sea, we're learning more about exports, NASA, and the National Science Foundation's epic research project to study the ocean's carbon cycle so that information from satellites can be used to make more accurate predictions of weather events and climate change. We start off talking with port engineer Paul Mauricio on board the research vessel Roger Revelle as it and the research vessel Sally Ride prepare to head to the northeastern Pacific Ocean with their cargo of scientists and technology on this first leg of the exports project. Okay, so anyway, right now we're in the uh, main control center. And as you see, there are bells ringing here all the time. The screens you see here record all the activity throughout the ship. Sensors are placed all throughout the, the ship and they can tell the temperatures and everything else. And all the controls for the engines and propulsion system are from here. The Ravel is 271 feet long. That's from the water line. It draws 17 feet of water. If it's full of fuel, it carries 252,000 gallons of gas or fuel, diesel. This sleeps, uh, we have 52, berthing for 52 on here. Sally Ride only has 36. It's much more luxurious over there. <laughs> but um, we can accommodate uh, quite a few more scientists. We have 4,000 square feet of lab space. Sally Ride has about 900. We operate under what's called diesel electric. We have six engines in the lower engine room and they produce electricity. We have electric motors in the back of the ship that actually do the propulsion. Oh. So there's no, it's not like the old ships where there's a big giant shaft. When we're on state, what we call on station, is we'll be required to stay in the same exact spot. And any conditions from, you know, no wind at all to up to 60 knots wind, the ship can maintain the same exact position. And this has the ability to map the ocean floor up to a 17 kilometer swath at the, at a deep depth and it gives really detailed images. But we can do that at up to about 12 knots speed. And so some of the expeditions we do are literally just to map the ocean floor. Scripps has mapped over a million miles of the ocean floor. Next, exports project scientist, Ivona Setnich. When people think about the ocean, they think blue. You know, nobody thinks, oh, there's an oceanic forest, there's an oceanic desert, and stuff like that. Where we go in the North Pacific, it's a kind of an oceanic desert. The time of the year, it's very desert-like. This is once in a lifetime. I mean, I hope these kind of projects are gonna be happening in the future, but this is like, it's happening now. It has never happened before. And so this is what I'm most excited about. And ultimately, when we have this data, when we actually line things together and start publishing these big papers, they're gonna explain the carbon pathways. We're gonna be able to really model the ocean, see the ocean in, in much, much better way than before. Next, University of Hawaii oceanographer Brian Pope. This is one of the wet labs, and it's, it's a lab where things can get wet. You don't see a lot of electronic equipment around unless the electronic equipment is made to get wet. <laughs> and what we're standing in front of here are things that trap the particles that are falling through, through the water. And we have tubes, they're closed at the bottom, and they have some caps on there that can be opened. And when they're open, the particles settle in and uh, get trapped. That's why they're called sediment traps. After three days of being in the ocean, these uh, caps can automatically close. So they're not disturbed when they're brought back up to the surface. And then there's a, a spigot down here at the bottom where you can drain those particles and transfer the, the things that you've collected over the last three days. These will be attached to these, almost like a buoy that's meant to be dropped into the ocean and, and settle to a particular depth horizon. And they'll stay there for three days and then they're programmed to come back to the surface after the top is closed. There's so many of them because we want to capture particles at many different depths because that tells us what's happening with those particles. Are they being degraded and by how much? My role in this is to, is to study the zooplankton. And zooplankton are crustaceans, they're little critters, they're related to lobster, but much tinier. They're really, really small. Some of them you, you can't see unless you have a microscope. They play a significant role 
a couple ways in how particles that are formed at the surface are exported at depth. You know, they're animals, so they eat the particles. And when they eat them, they respire carbon dioxide. So particle is settling through the water, and it can either just settle on its own, or if an animal eats it, well, it's gone, and it turns into carbon dioxide, and that returns back to the atmosphere. Because one of the big things we want to know is how much of atmospheric CO2 that exchanges with the upper ocean and, and gets fixed by phytoplankton gets exported to the deep depth, the deep ocean. And so zooplankton can eat it and return that CO2 to the water and then it to the atmosphere. However, when they eat the particle, they also make poop. <laughs> and so they can actually repackage those particles into something that may be more dense, uh -huh. that sinks more rapidly. So they could be taking really small particles, taking them into their gut, repackaging them as fecal matter, and that fecal matter may be exported really quickly. The zooplankton during the day, they uh, live at depth to avoid being eaten because uh -huh. it's dark and they can hide. But at night, they migrate to the surface where there are other things and it, there's much more biomass and they have much more food. So it's like every, every night, <laughs> they go to a smorgasbord. <laughs> it's right in the shallow water. But during the daytime, when they could be eaten by predators, they escape those predators by feeding at night. Now imagine those organisms that are coming up uh, during the nighttime to feed. If they take particles from the surface and then they swim down, they can take and release those particles as fecal matter at depth, and that's known as a shunt. So they're shunting that whole cycle instead of settling they're on an expressway down to deep water really quickly. Because they're literally being swum down by they're the zone. They're being swum like down, that. exactly. Yes, yes. The University of Hawaii's Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. We're talking with marine biologist Craig Carlson about tiny microbes like bacteria and their importance to the ocean food web. My group's a group of microbial oceanographers and we're interested in looking at how microbes are populated through the water column of our oceans and how they interact with nutrients, organic and inorganic, how they consume it and the byproducts that they produce. Microbes are interesting because they're standalone organisms. They're by themselves. They're not relying upon tissue like our cells in our body have to have the vascular system to support their growth, right? But microbes are they're standalone, unique organisms, and they all have to make a living. So they, they've created and devised strategies, metabolic strategies, to take advantage of opportunistic conditions. In our own bodies, there are certain types of microbes that live and take advantage of their specific niches. Similar in the water column or in an oceanic system, there are different organisms that have taken advantage of the energy and the nutrient fields that they live within to, to make a living. And they do great work for us. <laughs> <laughs> Microbes are, uh, they're everywhere, right? So in every drop of water, there's a million bacteria and they're distributed through 4,000 meter water columns. So there's a lot of mouths, mouths and bacteria or, or operations on, that the bacteria perform um, that are, are really important. But what we see is that the amount of particles that, that fall to the water column degrade or the, the, the amount shrinks as they go deeper and deeper in the water column because some of those particles are being consumed by microbes as it's passaging through the water column. Everyone thinks about bacteria as the things that make you sick or rot your food and, um, and those are true. There's a lot of bacteria that are pathogenic or, or that are bad for us. 
but the majority of the bacteria are, are really important for the biosphere. They're really important for taking materials and converting them into materials that other organisms can use. So without bacteria, without these or microbes, we would be um, in trouble. So they're really important for continuing the biosphere and the cycling of the big nutrient systems, the nitrogen cycle, the carbon and phosphorus cycle. They're really integral in making that whole system work. You know, microbes in our ocean help govern our climate. And so by taking up carbon dioxide or releasing carbon dioxide, they, they can change the way that the Earth system works. What we'll do is we'll fill these bottles up with our, with our different media and inoculum, which means the materials and substrates that they'll grow on, and the bacteria will be put into these, into these bottles. From every bottle, we'll take bacteria, dissolved organic matter, nutrients, uh, DNA, and so a variety of different samples can be taken from the exact same bottle. Next, Brandon Stevens shows us a shipping container used on board the Roger Ravel as a laboratory for radioactive work. So the rad part of rad band is the radioactive, and so this van is actually designated as a radioactive use area. And so they, they refer to these shipping containers also as vans, and we're in the radioactive, isolated van on the ship. As an undergrad, I was really interested in how pesticides transport through waterways and how that impacts our ecosystems. And as an undergrad, I, I worked in a USDA agricultural lab and we measured actually the, the, how pesticides bound to soil and we quantify very carefully how pesticides transport through the environment and that led me to get more into chemistry and uh, biology and physics and all these things you have to think about and that's really what you need for oceanography that brings all these things together the physics of the ocean, the biology, how the chemistry impacts the, the biology and so right now I'm just focusing on the biology side, the microbes, but I'm always thinking about what are we doing to our ecosystem and how can we protect it and the carbon cycle is pretty pretty important in that. The bigger picture of what we're trying to do here on exports is assess how microbes are uh, processing carbon and how efficient microbes are at respiring carbon and so we want to know the quantity of carbon that gets fixed by phytoplankton, how that phytoplankton gets eaten by zooplankton, and the leftover carbon that, that is not immediately sent up the food chain is respired by bacteria. And so the efficiency at which the bacteria can consume that, that fixed carbon source is really important. We have to know how well the, the carbon is respired out of the ecosystem and ultimately sent back in the atmosphere. And so there's essentially two big pathways of once carbon gets fixed, either sinks into the deep ocean or it's respired back into the, the atmosphere. And microbes are responsible for about 20 to 30 percent of that respiration. So but getting that number is, is really important. What we will do every day is to go out to the CTD and collect seawater into tiny bottles and bring that back into here where we are in the rad van and add uh, tritiated leucine. So this is a radioactive chemical. And we add it into tiny centrifuge bottles and vials and we spike it with this uh, leucine or, or protein and how efficient they are at um, consuming that leucine, incorporating it into their biomass, is ultimately what we're measuring. And this little tube will ultimately get spun down and we can measure the activity of the leucine on a, on a scintillation counter. We trace that, that radioactive tracer through, through, the, through their body and ultimately use that as a measure for how much carbon is incorporated into their, their cells. And we'll probably collect from 10 different depths uh, in the in the water and we'll incubate across those 10 depths trying to keep them as close to those in situ temperatures as possible so we'll have little coffee cans I guess we have some here so each of these is going to hold our uh, seawater 
These do a pretty good job, actually. Some of them, 24 hours, they, they, they advertise that, and we can attest to it. We can say <laughs> <laughs> your, your coffee cups really, really do hold the temperature, but after a few hours, it's, the temperature hasn't changed, and, and we, um, we kill them at the end of the three hours, unfortunately. We add trichloroacetic acid, and that kills the, all the bacteria in there. And that's stopping the reaction. That, that stops the, the, the incorporation of leucine. And then we spin them down with the centrifuge, add the scintillation cocktail, and then run that on the scintillation counter. This is the scintillation counter here. So this is a scintillation uh, rack. And it has some, uh, just some wipe tests that we did for this van, and we know it's clean. So we're starting from a clean van. And we put our sample containing the scintillation cocktail. And what it's going to do is shine a light through the sample and detect the, detect the disintegrations per minute as a, as a value. So it's how, how much of the isotope is shooting off of the, the sample. Thankfully, the amount of leucine that we're using is, is so low that we don't have to worry actually about the, the, the total quantity that we have. In fact, the amount that we brought can be transported um, in, a, in a, a regular car on the roadways. It's not such a high amount that we're going to have to wear protective equipment or uh, protective eyewear or have the, the monitor to see how much radioactivity we're exposed to. So it's, an, it's a lot for the bacteria, so we get a good signal but it's not too much for us. We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators, a passion to change lives, spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds, help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. We're learning how scientist Joe Cope sorts, identifies, and measures zooplankton collected from specialized nets towed behind the research ship. We're looking at the zooplankton. We take the samples from the mock nest and we're gonna bring them into here in the lab. And first thing we'll do is we'll split the sample, pour the sample into here. So you can see that there's a divider right in the center there. We pour the sample in here and we'll split it in half into these two trays. One of the trays will get preserved in formaldehyde that we can bring back to our laboratory and do species identifications and get counts and densities on the different animals. The other half we'll take and we'll pour through this set of nested sieves. So we have five sieves here starting with uh, 200 micron, it goes up to 500, 1,000, 2,000, and then to a 5,000 uh, micron mesh. So we pour the sample through these nested sieves. And so we'll have animals that are larger than 5,000 microns captured on the top sieve. And then we'll have animals between 2,000 microns and 5,000 microns on the second sieve, and so on down through the next couple sieves. The animals collected on here will be concentrated down onto a pre-weighed filter. And then we can bring that back to the lab and weigh each of these filters so we have an estimate of the biomass of each of the different size fractions. You got the phytoplankton sequestering the CO2 in the, in, the, in the surface waters. The zooplankton eat the phytoplankton and then they will poop out some of that carbon and that carbon will sink down through the water column. So the different size fractions of the zooplankton will excrete or poop out different amounts of this carbon. So it gives us a better estimate of the carbon export uh, at, at a community level. And is this type of zooplankton work something you've been doing for a while? Yes, yeah, I've been doing this for 20, 
30 years. I've done Pacific, Atlantic, uh, Antarctica. You always see something different. There's all, you always think you've seen all the plankton there is to see, and then all of a sudden you'll see something like, what the heck is that? You know, there's always, there's always a chance of seeing something that I've never seen before, maybe no one's seen before. We work 24-7 around the clock. When, when we're at sea, we're focused on, on collecting data and, and fulfilling the mission. We try to make it as pleasant as possible, but uh, you'll notice when you walk around the ships that the, the amenities are, are fairly spartan. We're, we're out here to be efficient and uh, use taxpayer dollars uh, so that we can stretch them and get the most science done that we can for every dollar. We're doing basic research at sea and we're learning incredible things about the ocean and we're extrapolating uh, that to the, you know, what we observe in satellites with this exports program. But all along the way, we and train students, we think it's really important, especially today, to make sure that we're, we're also including the next generation of scientists in every phase of what we do, from uh, undergraduate to graduate education, You'll see that there's levels of involvement um, by students throughout the process so that someday they'll be able to go to sea and, and be in charge of a research cruise like this or, or maybe be involved in policy, but then they'll know, you know what goes on out here on these ships and how important it is to, uh, to society. Next, chief scientist for this cruise, Debbie Steinberg. Carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere um, makes its way into the surface ocean. And humans, by burning fossil fuels, are putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than we used to have, and that is warming our planet. And the oceans take up about a quarter of that extra carbon dioxide that humans are putting into the atmosphere. And so that carbon dioxide um, comes into the surface waters, plants through photosynthesis take it up, and that's its entry into the biological pump. One of the things we're interested in is what um, portion of that mesopelagic community is resident and what portion is migrating. And we think it might be half or something like that. And why is NASA that studies outer space, um, in, interested in the inner space of the ocean. That's because satellites are, are such a wonderful tool to study the ocean, because it's the only way we can get a global view of the world's you know, snapshot of what's happening in, this, in the surface ocean on, on the planet. We can really try and push the envelope of what we can measure by satellite, and we're going to ground truth it with what we're measuring on the ship. It's also a lot of fun to be out here and to work with all these great people and just to be doing science. It's a lot of fun. Exports researchers are currently working together to analyze data collected during this research cruise to the northeastern Pacific Ocean. In 2020, export scientists will head to the Atlantic for comparison studies. All exports data will be made publicly available online. Mahalo for watching Voice of the Sea. University of Hawaii's Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant.